So our guest today for the Horn Notes video podcast is Dr. Peter Iltis. Welcome. Well, uh, thank you. Nice to be here. Um, in recent years, he's been a principal investigator for some very exciting MRI studies of horn playing, which are now part of a growing series on YouTube. And he's professor of kinesiology and horn at Gordon College. So to begin, I know that some of your earlier research started focused on uh, movement disorders, such as focal task-specific dysphonia in musicians. That's correct. And I've had a suspicion for years that part of the problem for hornists with dystonia issues is that they were influenced unduly by visualizations heard from teachers or read in books rather than playing with a physiologically correct approach. Mm -hmm. What have MRI studies opened up in this regard? Well, we're really at the very beginning stages of that, John. Uh, we're doing studies which are basically comparing elite horn players to horn players with dystonia. One of the things that my colleague in Germany at the Institute for Music Physiology and Musicians Medicine, Dr. Eckhart Altenmüller, proposes is that musicians' dystonia in brass players probably doesn't just involve the muscles of the embouchure, but also may very well involve the tongue and muscles of the throat as well. So the question becomes, how do you start studying this? If all you do is use this RT, real-time MRI technology, to look at dystonic players, then you really don't know what to compare it to. What's normal, what's optimal, or is there even such a thing? So I think uh, the original intent was to do comparative studies looking at what elite performers do, making some basic assumptions. Those assumptions being they play beautifully, they have long-lasting careers, right. and they've probably learned a few tricks that help them to do well. So what do they do, and can we find patterns then that typify their behavior? I'll stop there and let you continue. Well, yeah, I mean, this is like leading into all kinds of interesting stuff. That's where the where you've gone with these studies and there's so much potential to go further. And just like on my own end of this too, my actual doctorate's in brass pedagogy. I'm I have been really interested for years in in some of the stuff in horn text that you really you look at it and you can only really describe it as a visualization. Mm -hmm. That's probably maybe sort of helpful, but maybe not. And it, it's something you have to be very careful about. Yep. Um so so I got a few topics um, that I'd like to kind of talk through sure. as, as part of our conversation here, I'm kind of looking at these things. So, um, and without intending to be real controversial mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. I've drawn my topics um, for this conversation from the Bible. Yeah. That is The Art of French Horn Play by Philip Farkas. Of course. Uh, which is a classic book, and I don't mean to trash the book. It has so much interesting stuff in it. But there are some flaws in the book um, in terms of, some specifics that that really are worth kind of kind of you know considering directly yeah. as uh, as horn players. So to start, I have a topic that your stu studies may not have actually looked at yet. Yeah, go ahead. So this may just be a direction, but one of his big topics has to do with mouthpiece pressure. Oh boy. And I, I kind of think that a lot of people are trying too hard to play with too little pressure based on what they've read in the book. Have you? gotten to that topic yet or it's it's in the future well about all i could say to you that we've seen on these mri videos is you can definitely see um the mouthpiece indentation on the lips itself in a sagittal view or a side view as we call it um and without question there there is considerable pressure there with all of our players you just don't see anybody putting a mouthpiece on lips that don't become somewhat indented so, I mean, you can see that visually without even using MRI, of course. But in terms of measuring pressure, uh, we have not done anything with that. That would involve uh, another technology that probably wouldn't be compatible with the MRI itself. So, yeah, still, there'd still be like pressure gauges. That. But it, it, I think it's, it's a good topic. You yeah. could explore perhaps more. It has been explored in some studies, I know, with trumpets and things. Yeah. Um, so... Well, I've got another like big topic right away. Years ago, when I was working on some playing problems, yep. a teacher recommended I look at the point, the a section of the Farkas book where he talks about the four points of resistance. Oh, this will be good. <laughs> so, according to Farkas, there are two points that are more or less fixed: the horn and the mouthpiece taken together, mm -hmm. and the lip aperture, what he calls the lip aperture, mm -hmm. and two points of resistance that are controllable the base of the tongue, back where you say K, and the voice box or larynx. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, of course, he did that at benefit of MRI technology. So right. how much of this did he get right? Well, um, the first thing is we got to be careful that it's the larynx. That's what we call this thing. And larynx. Yep, Sorry, I'm, I'm okay. from Kansas. <laughs> I pronounce things funny sometimes. No I don't problem. like to say French words at all. Yeah. So we actually have done a fair amount with this. And um, in my last visit, which was only two weeks ago, uh, we really fine-tuned our ability to study some of these things. So let me talk to you about what we have as unpublished data. Uh, fact is, I may not even be presenting this in New York next week, but basically we looked at both. I had a phone call from a student, Sarah Gillespie, who is studying at the University of Wisconsin, and she called along with her uh, horn teacher to ask me some questions about this very idea. How involved might the glottis be in playing? And her approach, as has been the approach, the approach in other, other uh, groups, was to do um, you know, a laryngoscopy, stick a tube down a person's nose with a little camera and have them play, quote, normally while you watch the vocal cords. <laughs> yeah, with, with a thing stuck down your right. nose. Right, and while you're like gagging. Like you could play normally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I was, I was very reticent to, to, to support that idea. I don't think it's natural. And I had done just enough at the Max Planck Institute to know that there are lots of things that you can look at. And so I told her, let me go and do some experimentation, and I'll see if we can do this with MRI. So um, there's actually a long story here, so I'll tell you just a short part, and then you can probe, I guess, if you want to. My first attempts at this, I was the subject in the chamber, and all I was doing was vocalizing on and off so that I knew the vocal cords were coming together. And we were trying to image in what we call a cross-sectional or a transverse view actually slicing through the vocal cords like you might see in some of those books in uh, vocal pedagogy uh, where you can see that voice box opening and closing. Well, it turned out that with me, uh, we just accidentally, quite frankly, stumbled onto some pretty good images. And aha, we've done it. So uh, invited Sarah to come to Germany and she wanted to study this very question. Are the vocal cords or the glottis, is the glottis involved? So she came, and the first couple of days that we were there, we tried to image her and a couple of other subjects that we had there. And simply put, when you align an MRI scanner, the, the, the plane of scanning that you do is very narrow. It's maybe three, four millimeters in thickness. So if there's any upward or downward movement of the larynx, you're going to have the structure moving in and out of focus. And we just, this was absolutely prohibitive. We, we could not get that to happen because she wanted to study the involvement of the chords on different notes. And the larynx moves up and down, clearly, on different notes, despite everything you might have read. So with that in mind, we had to find another way to do it, and I can tell you more about that. But if you have a question about what I've just said, let me go ahead and give you a chance to ask. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, first off, I mean, it's a big topic, and it's, it's the sort of thing to a point – I know just from a teaching angle, yeah. some people you do have to talk about this with, yeah. but you kind of don't want to because then they start thinking about mm -hmm. it too much. Mm -hmm. And then it's like all this, this stuff like, wait a minute, I'm trying to, blah, blah, blah. you know, right. but, but I, I think the underlying thing is there's like a, you know, people will say, don't do blah, blah, blah. But actually there's a lot happening yeah. that is, you're so, um, uh, what's the term? There's a term like that. I, I often, I, I tell people like, uh, to do as an example, they, to play their horn normally, put their normal hand in the bell, yeah. then switch the horn around the other way and put your wrong hand in the bell. Yeah. And you can feel the sound waves, you can feel the air hmm. on your left hmm. hand, but you can't feel it on your right hand, even though it's happening all the time. Because you're so used so to I, it. So I think that's like, there's like what's happening inside these structures. Sure. You know, we're, there's, there's, we have no real sensation of it. Yeah. Well, so let me, let, me, let me clarify then what we moved ahead with and tell you that actually I think we learned a lot and are still learning a lot. Um, so the problem we had, as I said, was being able to keep these things in the plane of focus of the MRI scan. So yeah. I stayed up most of the night one night just looking at anatomical drawings and trying to think about other ways to do it. And very briefly, what we came up with was what is called a coronal section. Uh, as an example, if you were to take a big blade and you were to slice down through the top of your head and divide it into front and back halves and <laughs> have a gross image, peel that away, and you can see structures 
that you're looking end on at as opposed to in cross section? Well, the vocal cords run anatomically anteriorly to posteriorly. They hook up on the back side of the, of the larynx, at the top of the larynx. So we basically found a way to slice down through not so much the vocal cords, but the arytenoid cartilages, which sit at the very back of the vocal mechanism. These are what the cords are attached to. And there are very beautiful muscles that close and open those arytenoid cartilages, moving them in and out. And, of course, that's what moves the vocal cords in and out. We found very, very nice images of these in the coronal plane, and we therefore could then do some measurements with people actually speaking and playing their horns. And I can tell you right now, um, a lot of people aren't going to be happy <laughs> because what we found uh, well, it quite supports some of Farkas's ideas, which I, I always, frankly, did believe from my own experience, John, as a player. But... Um, what did we do? Well, we looked at different things. We looked at playing high notes. We looked at playing low notes. We looked at playing soft notes. We looked at playing loud notes. We looked at different combinations of loudness and highness and softness and lowness. Uh, we looked at staccato playing. Uh, we looked at note changes. And in these films, um, in our first run with Sarah Gillespie's subjects, we got some pretty conclusive images that are showing that the vocal cords are very much involved in all of these activities, John. Um, I have to tell you that from a quantitative point of view, as, as I began to analyze these data, it was fine for her dissertation, but in terms of the scientific rigor that we could apply to the numbers and things that we were seeing, there were some technical difficulties, but conclusively, Movements are occurring, and we can talk about what those looked like if you'd like. Oh yeah. Well, here let's. Uh, this, this is getting into the topic of tonguing, which I'd like to get into more in okay. part two here. Sure. So let's take a little break here. Sure. Uh, so first, I, I'd like to thank uh, Peter Ilsis for joining us here and the Horn Notes Video Podcast, and be watching for a part two of this conversation where we continue on tonguing. <laughs> 